Good evening, folks. Here we are. We're back with some more lispiness to get done. Hope you're all doing well. Let's see who's lurking around at the moment. So, hello to Arasus and Bug Number Thirteen, and Darius and Davex Unit, um, Kaknas or Kaknas? Sorry, I'm getting that wrong. Uh, Shimera, Skinny Seahorse, and Tade. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, seeing that Bug Number Thirteen is watching this stream and Shimera's stream, but. Chimera is also in this stream, so I don't know what's going on there. People watching, people watching, people watching less. Um, thank you so much, Darius. Audio and video is okay. Good. So we are good to go. I will be applying caffeine heavily today to, to get us through. Um, so we're going to start off with a quick review of uh, where we were. I'm actually thinking I'm going to derail this stream quite heavily and and because I, I know now what I want to... Another project that I want to uh, look into, another thing I want to try implementing. But we'll get to that in due course. So, last week, last week we did a bit of a uh, triplanar mapping. Let's see if I can jump over here. Yes. And I'll give you the link. Sorry um, it was so late getting this video onto YouTube, YouTube people. Um, I kept on thinking I was going to have time to... Uh, fix a load of things before now uh, I was, thought I was going to do some lisping over the weekend but that did not happen um, hey Matian alright so what we're seeing on the screen is a little bit different from oh wait a second just need to get things in the right place yes um, what we're seeing down here is a little different from what we had last week in that it's actually behaving so if we look if we look down, if I can get into a decent position, uh, we should be able to see that the tiles are a decent size from the top. Um, that's looking okay. And we can see that if we go over to this wall, if we find a wall that is... Uh, bloody hell, let's slow down a bit. Move a bit slower. A vertical wall here. We can see that this one is also textured quite nicely. Um, but we also do see that when we come over to diagonals, um, where the textures are being mixed, uh, that things don't line up so well. Um, I'm not so worried about that because that's an understood problem and yeah, it's more uh, on a thing of how to apply the technique. Um, but the main thing was that, yeah, these things on the verticals and these ones on the tops are mapping correctly now. And the reason it wasn't last week was due to an issue with the normals. That's something we found out right towards the end. So I went on a little jolly and found this and you can always rely on these people because the frostbite engine is very fucking impressive um and in here on page no 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 um well it's, it's page six of the pdf and page 43 for in the uh, on the actual page um we find this which is a way of calculating the normal um sampling from a height map and all they're doing here is sampling a texture in a bunch of places doing some math and then yeah and getting the results so we are going to i think i've already got this copied in the code but we are going to look at this um so let's jump over here let's see if i tweak this at all before i did hoping not doesn't look like it. Look like it's fine. Excellent. Good. Okay, so this is their function. They're producing a float 3. They're taking in float 2 UVs, uh, a texel size and a texel aspect. And you can see what they're doing is they are sampling this texture in four places. Actually, let's get the doodling device, the long forgotten doodling device back into play. Um, oh, this is going to be a bit of a clusterfuck, but we will we will get there. Sorry for the loud noises. Right, okay, so they're passing in a UV, which is say this, and then they're sampling here and here and here and here, and getting those height values and then producing a normal like this. We'll get into this bit very soon. Um, but you can see rather than just sampling, they're sampling right and left and up and down and things like this, and they're sampling by minus one, but they're multiplying this by texel size first. So this is going to be um, one over the size of the texture. So text size. 
and that's going to let them sample an individual texel. So that's like instead of going one to the left and one to the right, um, sorry, where is it? One to the left and one to the right, they're going to be going um, one texel to the left, one texel to the right. So that's the general idea of this. And then they're getting the value out of that and they're multiplying it by something called texel aspect. So this is, they're sampling this whole thing da, 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 and then doing the multiply. So they're, they're scaling up this value in some cases. But there's a bit of this that kind of confuses me. It's the fact that this value is always two. And I, I it bothered me for a while. And I'm still not entirely happy with it and that's the kind of thing I want to look at now and it's, it's one of these really infuriating things where it's dead simple um, so it shouldn't be causing me issues but in the <laughs> I don't know uh, what would you call it in the um, by way of being open we will we will have a look at this and we'll get to have another yet one more video where I look like a muppet over something very simple so doodling device TM yes we're back um, Okay, so Metian, this is, like, I think I mentioned already, this code that we're, this result over here is a little different um, from what's on GitHub now. So I wouldn't try pulling that just yet, but we'll get to it soon. Um, and so the first thing is, why two ever? So let's take a really simple line. Let's take a very badly drawn line. And we're going to say this gradient is one. So every unit we go across one, we're also going to go down one. I should really draw it the other way, shouldn't I? So it's it's going up, but this will do. So every time we go across one, we're going down one. And then we're going to pick a position to sample. We're going to sample here, right? So we're going to look to the right one. Let's say that's here. And we're going to look to the left one. So do, 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 do. let's just draw a line here, there, and there. And so by going left one, we've also gone up one. So let's say that this height here was zero. Let's pick another color. We've got another, oh great, yes, the line annihilator. Um, yeah, let's say it's zero here. I hope that shows up, kinda. So this point will be zero. And this point will then be one. And this point will be minus one. Oops, minus one. Okay. So we're going to take the difference between these. So it's one minus minus one, which is obviously two. And then the distance across is actually two units, right? We sampled one, to the, one unit to the left and one unit to the right, um, which makes sense. Two over two is one. That's what we expected. Every time we go right one, um, we go up one. Sorry, every time we go left one, we go up one as well. So that kind of gives us the gradient we expect. And it explains this two up here. So this is the result of sampling one to the left and one to the right. This total distance here is two. And it might be a bit weird that that's why to some, but you've got to remember that if we have a steep line, one where, say, it's going down two for every one across, then the normal, if we pick a point here, is going to be um, two horizontally for every one up. So this line here is the normal. Because if it was um, if if it was the same thing, if it, otherwise it would get steeper as the line gets steeper, and that is not correct. We're staying perpendicular to that. I need more coffee because I'm explaining things terribly at the moment. But um, does the Twitch app support AirPlay, or am I just hallucinating? I have no idea. Akala Dakla. Let's have a look at that actually. Akala. Akala Kadaka. Akala Kadaka. I'll try and remember that. Did I miss 100 episodes whilst I was hallucinating? I have no idea what episode I'm on anymore. <laughs> like, 
it was like a hundred and I just incremented it. Like it was 173, I think, last week or something stupid like this. So I put 174 and I it's one of them was wrong and I didn't have time to check because I noticed just before the video. So um Yep. Bug number 13 says Baggers is talking about normals and probably about paranormals too in a second. Yes. Caffeine's a hell of a drug. It is just the right level. It went from 72 to 173. Excellent. That's the kind of counting that has got me where I am today. Um, but that's the thing, like... On YouTube, actually. Is that correct? Like... My logged in is here. Dun, 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 my channel. Um... Pushing pixels, view full playlist. Yeah, it can't be 100 and whatever, can it? That'd be ridiculous. No, yeah, 73. Okay. Yeah, that should be. Okay, so that should be. That should be 74, not 173. Wrong in every direction. That's great. Anyway. The bit that's confusing me about this is. I'm just wondering, was this going to work through? Ooh. Just get rid of that crap. Okay. The bit's confusing is the reason this was 2 here is that the distance we were sampling was 2. And that seems to be making the assumption that the um, units coming back from sampling this texture are in the same scale as this. So say one unit represents one meter um then we're saying that one unit from the texture is also equal to a meter unless of course you are then multiplying by texel aspect i guess this is what this corrects for here is if you want to scale that value um you can do <sighs> so yes that's scaling it to make sure it's in the same kind of space as Whatever this this is meant to be, and this texel size thing, um, yeah, this is this is specifically to do with the texture. But the way our functions work is that we pass in some function that we give a, a vec two, and, and it returns a float, and we have an offset, which is very similar to the texel size saying where to sample this function. So it might be sampling a texture, but it might be doing something else. And so it feels weird for this just to be 2 rather than the offset multiplied by 2. But I'm not even sure if like offset is the correct thing to do here. Um, is it necessarily the same thing here? Um, I also have scale, which is doing the same as Texel aspect is. So my texel size is offset and my um, texel aspect is scale. And, and I'm just not sure what I should be doing here. Um, because if my offset is one, then this is gonna be two. Um, should that scale up as offset increases? One would assume, or I, I would assume off the top of my head, but that could be wrong. Um, yeah, that's, that's just something that's been, that's been kind of bothering me. And I wanted to see what your folks' opinion on this was um, before I shove this up into Nineveh and cause people problems. NTW Games saying, have you ever thought about creating a paid online course for game development in Lisp? Well, I would hope to be quite a bit better at it if I was going to ask for money. Um, I do have a Patreon, um, which I put up there because people asked me to. Um, and I'm very, very grateful. I haven't taken out from it for a while because I use it as a kind of, um, as a fund to allow me to go and code down the coffee shop. And I haven't been coding Lisp uh, down there for a while, so I haven't been pulling money out of it. But I should do again when I get back up to speed. Um, okay, so Elevator Simulator is saying regarding that uh, streaming to the TV things, it's just you can reroute the video stream. Excuse me, from iOS itself. All right. Um, <laughs> As I said, it's just off by an order of magnitude referring to the episode. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. You know. 
Only one order of magnitude, so that's alright. <laughs> um, alright, so... What to do? Um, to, to be honest, the main thing I wanted to do here was just say this out loud and see if it made sense. Um, because... Let's, let's have a look. Let's have a look. And one of the other worries as well is, is the other code I've got, the stuff that's meant to be drawing the normals, is that working properly? Because I'm seeing some odd results there, and it's a little bit disturbing to me. So, what we're going to do is we are going to go to, we're in the render file here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the um, Perlin noise thing I've got here. And I'm going to swap it out with sign. Um, not like that, like this. And so what we have here is a mesh. If I look at what I've been changing recently, um, I changed prims slightly, which is the file that has some of the uh, uh, mesh generation code. So here we're calling Nineveh and saying, hey, I'd like a lattice, um, which is just a grid of um, of a, a grid of quads or a grid of triangles in this case. Um, it is 10 by 10 and it's got 200 segments by 200 segments. Um, so that's what this is. And then we're displacing it by the sign of the, um, where are we? Render. We're displacing it by the sign of the X position. So this should be a sine wave that is going from minus five to five. Remember that the size was 10, even though there was 200 um, rows and columns. And if we go and look here, we can see that this matches up. We've got sine X from X minus five to five, and we can see that little lip there, the hump, and then the start of the next one here. And that is exactly what we've got here. So at least that seems sane. Um, and what we're going to do is we are going to go back to base and show the normals. And I'm going to do something with the normals. Let's have a look. I'm going to go to the normal generation code and there's a magnitude in here somewhere. There it is. Magnitude is 0.4. I'm going to set it up to 0.9. This was easier to see, um, easier to work with when I didn't have a lot more triangles, uh, when I had a lot less triangles. But let's just go here. And this is where some of this stuff just feels a little janky to me. Um, is I'm come up to this curve, and my gut reaction is that's wrong, right? This seems to be going down at one angle. And this seems to be pointing up. Um, and it could be a perspective thing, but it could be the function being wrong. Um, up here, I mean, it doesn't look terrible, but I'm not sure. Um, so let's just have a look. If we just bring up the REPL, I believe that our second camera, camera one, is an orthographic camera. It is. Uh, let's see what happens. Um, what's its position right now? Camera one. Um, all right. Oh, let's see what happens. Let's. Uh, I think there's something called current camera. Yeah. And if we set up the current camera um, to be camera one. Well, you have my attention, but I have no idea what's going on there. Um, rotation of camera one. Uh, let's set off that. To quaternion identity. Well, that didn't make much difference. <laughs> um, if we're doing it with the sine of x, then we're going to want to be... We're going to want to set our position, so position of camera one. Yeah, we do want to be, the positive direction is towards us. So we're going to sit at like, yeah, Z20 or whatever. I suppose it doesn't really make too much difference there. Um,
Okay. I'm very much not seeing what I expected to see here, and I'm wondering why. Oh, wait. No. Hmm. Let's have a look at camera one. This might be more trouble than it's worth because when trying to understand something, I probably shouldn't be trying to use something I don't use very often. I don't use the orthographic code in this very often at all. Um, this is projection orthographic. Oh, I actually haven't started the... Um, not only shop. I am in the wrong language. What are we looking for here? It is slime enable um, concurrent hints. Let's have a look at this function. Frame width, frame height, near and far. Um, so frame size of the current camera is what we're looking for. Of um, come on now, camera one is nil so let's just set that so um what happens if we just set this to 20 by 20. what is interesting is the length of the it just feels we're look like we're looking at this at a funny angle or just that the normals are super long which is interesting to me Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing what I've got here, to be honest. So, now let's... <laughs> As handy as it would be if this was working correctly, I don't want to confuse myself more than I already am. So let's set the current camera back to camera zero and we will have a look at, um, at some of that stuff again another day. And so before I was actually worried that I was seeing um, different length normals as well. Um, so let's zoom in on one of the areas that just feels weird to me. This bit here. And let's think it could be completely fine. But if I go to... Um, where is it? It's normals. Calculate normals. If I go down here, we've got this offset um, by two thing. Offset is one. When I change that, when I remove that multiply by two, that looks a lot more perpendicular. That looks wrong. That looks a bit weird. That looks kind of fine. Which is a bit annoying. Because the distance that we're sampling is multiplied, is one times offset. So we're doing one to the left and one to the right of that. So you would have thought that that is the horizontal distance. So why does this look better? Um, and again, it might just be that I'm p picking at particular points where it suits, where I'm kind of getting a confirmation bias here. Um, and this is just bothering me. And so, yeah, I mean, this, this could very well be fine. Yeah, I'm not able to draw any good conclusions from that, to be honest. I would have thought that was correct. But I'm not too sure. And the reason I'm also doubtful... I mean, just to prove as well, if, if I just remove, take this down to two. Oh, wait a second. Ah, two times offset and 
just two are different again, which is kind of annoying. Okay, but that is definitely wrong. As you can see, they were all just pointing straight up. Um, so that's rather, that's rather incorrect. Yes. Okay, so... Can I animate the sine wave? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't think it'll fix any perspective problems, but I mean, we can easily animate the sine wave. Let's just go back to render and go up here. Pass in time, which is float, and we do x plus time. And then we go down here, and we're going to have to pass it into both of them. So we're going to have to do time is now, and time is now. Then we compile that, and now it's a big old wave. And it looks fine, but so the reason I'm concerned, the reason I'm concerned is this seems vaguely sensible to me, but this is made by people who know what the fuck they're doing, right? So I uh, maybe actually textile aspect is enough. Maybe you just need to scale this to that because hmm. No. I was thinking it would be divide by a second for a second, but um, yeah, I think what you probably actually do is just scale this to match your um, to match the units that you would expect coming back from this, and that's probably what I should be doing. And let's try that then. Um, I'm going to stop the animation just because it actually makes it a little harder to work with. Um, let's so we'll comment out time for now. Hold on. <laughs> the fuck? There we go. Uh, only one of them compiled for a second there. All right, so. Let's have a look. Elevator Simulator saying, Hey, backers, I think you once mentioned somewhere that you thought GLSL would benefit from a more expressive type system uh, to distinguish between view space and clip space and types. Do you think expressive type system, like independently typed languages, could have pract practical use in high-performance graphical computations? Hmm. Okay, so... Usefulness has context. For a beginner, one of the things... I got caught up with was working in different spaces because there's like just just operations when you add two vectors together that are in different spaces it doesn't necessarily make sense and so having something that caught that would have been fun and I, I did add that to Vario I don't like how I added it in fact the way I've added it has caused all kinds of problems um, but it is something you could encode as like a dependent type um, and yeah, so in that to that extent, it like I do think it could be useful to some people. I don't think it would really move the needle at all for people who are already experts. Um, so I don't think you would. I don't think you could realistically say, "Hey, if we had these kind of expressive type systems in these kind of languages, it would change, you know, like the state of art, state of the art in computer graphics." I don't think it would because I think these people are smart enough to know what they're doing and they're already doing it. In fact, there's a lot of evidence of that. Um, but yes, it would still be cool, and it, it does allow for some interesting. Yeah, it just allows again for it's kind of validation and verification. It's a, an interesting thing to have. Um, so when I did my first PBR implementation, that was using some of that stuff, and I'm thinking of getting back to PBR, not using those little things. Um, it, it's that's actually one part of the compiler that I'm thinking of deprecating, um, which is the kind of the thing that traces where values go in the program. Um, but I'm pretty sure I was misusing that for some other things as well, potentially related to... Potentially related to... 
tessellation. I can't remember though. I can't remember. So I'll have to go and check that out. But one day what I'd actually like to do is do a second version of Vario, which is... So there's that compiler I'm doing at the moment. Well, I was doing for SIMD. I will be getting back to um, the data processing SIMD compiler. And it's also... It's going to compile down to SIMD intrinsics, but also to compute shaders. And I would like to take that type system that I've got there, which isn't dependently typed, but it's still quite nice. And make a shader language kind of thing in Lisp using that. Um, that would be really cool. Maybe I use that as a kind of replacement for Vario. Maybe I deprecate the old one one day. But this is like all so far off that I, I'm not worried about it. Like Vario is going to be around for a long time. Um, and I have no plans to break the current API as it stands. So, yep, that's where it is. But I, I am actually thinking of ripping out that um, value tracking kind of stuff that I use as an alternative to pen types. So, actually, let's see if I've got some code around here because it's, it's so arm wavy for me to be saying this stuff um the works what was it called it's in lark and let's see where would it be let's just rep for space yuck um okay so let me just get rid of those tabs for a second All right, so I was passing in, let's see if I've got things here. Okay, so I was passing in vector spaces. So I wanted to have an object that represented a space rather than just a matrix, because a matrix represents a transform between two spaces. Um, I thought this would be cool. And then what you could do is you could say, hey, within this scope, I'm in a certain space. And I can make these, um, these vectors, these, this SV here is spatial vector. So it's, it's a vector which is within a space. And so when I make it here, this is a vector in cam, oh, sorry, in world space. And then when this value leaves this scope, it gets implicitly converted to the next um, space that it's in, so in camera space. So when this compiles, you get an implicit, implicit conversion from world space to camera space. It means you can't end up taking these vectors from two different spaces and adding them together in a way that just wouldn't make any sense. Um, so you can see here, this thing is in model space, this thing is in world space, this is in camera space, and so this just works. These, these will end up in the correct spaces for this to make sense. Um, but to do this, because this isn't a real value in GLSL, we have to resolve all this stuff at compile time, which means we need to know everywhere this exact space went. Um, so we can replace it with the correct transforms later on. Because we, we're going to need to upload a matrix, um, which is the, let's have a look, the world space to camera space and the model space to camera space matrix. And so it has to track all that, that all the way through and then it, it passes that information back down to Keppel. And then Keppel goes, okay, it needs one of these matrices and passes it up as an implicit uniform and everything just kind of works. Um, it's neat, but it makes, I mean, the Vario compiler is a shitty compiler anyway, uh, in that it's not made particularly well. It's not made by someone who knew how to do compilers well. Um, and this thing made it way more complicated. So a lot of fun, and it took, yeah, took me a lot of time, but it was a lot of fun. Um, but I, it's one of, the, like the way that was done, I'm thinking of replacing. So anyway, that's that. Um, what were we doing? We were doing something. We have this, and we wanted to try something. We did the sine wave thing, like they, we animated it and went, oh, that's cool. Um, but it was confusing to us. Jason's saying Vario is awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, Vario is a... is a success, right? Like, it's... Ex I mean, I'm obviously using it all the time. All of this is being compiled through Vario, and, like, like Keppel's loads of fun to me, and all of that relies on the work in Vario. I'm really happy with the result, um yeah no ma no bad mouthing it like that i am bad mouthing it yeah it's true um but yes there's a lot of messiness in it that just makes me unhappy and i would rather change it out and be able to implement something like traits um which could bring us some interesting things inside um inside yeah glsl 
Because one of the things we don't have, we don't have any abstractions over sequences of any kind. Um, which there could be some uses for. Um, or I just find traits to be quite a nice thing when you're dealing with... Like, to be able to have generic functions and then have those monomorphized down, is just it's just tidy. It fits these kind of um, languages reasonably well. And I just like that idea. Um, I can't remember what, what sequence stuff I was actually interested in. Oh yeah, I suppose it was being able to have map and reduce and things like that actually implemented in a vaguely sensible way. But, like, would it be sensible? I don't know. Probably not. Because that kind of horizontal stuff isn't what you normally do in on the GPU. It's like you're much more likely to, again, reorganize that work so you can do it across, like, loads of compute threads, for example. But yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that another time. That's that's another problem. Okay, so I'm not saying that uh, Vario is PHP, but it has the similarity in the like it is a success despite its bad design. You know, like I I, I find this more pleasant to work with than PHP, uh, but underneath the hood, it, it's clearly made by someone who wasn't who didn't know enough to do it right. And PHP definitely feels like something that was made by someone initially who just threw things at it rather than thinking about it. Um, what the fuck were we doing? I can't remember. Oh, are we going to try and redo this in terms of... Come on, something to do with normals. Um, we were going to change this to 2 and we were going to redo this in terms of... This, maybe? Maybe that's what we were going to do? Hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, so the last thing, I remember us looking at this and going, oh, it's weird because when you just use offset, it kind of looks better, but only when eyeballing it and blah, and this is probably, but we should just remove this and actually, well, not exactly like that, but we should be using scale to take care of these things. So we have offset, which is going to allow us, this is, uh, this is our texel size, so we can replace offset with... I don't like using texture size in this case because this takes an arbitrary function, not necessarily a texture sampling function. But we still need to remap these so that they make sense given the offset that we're using. So um, if we go and look at, where is it? Simple sample normals. Um, if we change this to 0.4, what are we doing? Okay, so what are we saying? We are going to sample a bit to the left and a bit to the right. And that is going to give us a value between 0 and minus 1. <sighs> but it's not correct though. We multiply it by scale. Out of interest, what happens if we stick 200 here? Oh, it looks a bit better. Hmm. <laughs> the reason I picked 200 is because of this. Um. Because in ah, it's a bit confusing, really. This is just where I'm not thinking clearly, and it's 
it's really annoying to me. I'm not sure what the correct scale will be here. I get the rough idea. Okay, so we don't want to sample too far, right? We're sampling a little to the left and a little to the right because this function that we're calling, which in this case is just sign, um, if we start sampling one to the left and one to the right or whatever, we're going to be sampling like a completely different part of the curve. And we're not interested in that. We're just going to sample just either side of this point or this point, just either side so we can get the normal. So that's what the offset is letting us do. But then the value we get back... Um, the difference between those things is going to be very small. It's going to be smaller because we're not sampling that whole one unit of distance. Um, so it's going to basically be well, twice this, which is 1 over 100. Um, and multiply that by 2, which is 200. So that does feel like the right thing. But again, it just feels like I'm I'm throwing in values which seem right to me, and it's not, this isn't satisfying. I don't feel like I've learned something here. I just feel like I've bodged something into working. And I just can't resolve that this is always two without um, using this scaling factor, this textual aspect um, factor. And that is slightly annoying. And I don't really know where to extract more information from this. Um, other than to go on a big old Google of them and try and find um, more explanations for how this works. This, um, I mean, let's have a look. So where is this listing one? Blah, 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 blah. Um, I think that's around here. The normal can be computed in multiple ways. We found a simple four sample cross filter works well enough for us, listing one. <laughs> That's it. That's all the details. So we would need to find more information on this. And it's kind of not what I want to do on this stream because we're just going to spend ages doing that. And it's not really fun. That's something I'd rather do on my own time. So unless um, someone has some insight, if they do, yell out. Um, I'm not really looking for numbers to bodge this to work because we can do that. That's not a big deal. Um, the big deal is trying to understand why and and all that kind of side of it. Why this, why this form? Why not offset here? What should we be doing? Um, and for bonus points, why does this look slightly wrong? And is it? Um, am I using this incorrectly? Because it, once again, it feels like that difference between uh, this and the steeper one. The normal isn't steeper. The normal is, what am I doing? If I have a steep thing here, then the normal is shallower. Um, maybe, maybe I'm just getting this wrong. Like, when the step is very small, maybe this needs to increase. Um, maybe if it wasn't, maybe it wasn't multiplied by offset. Maybe I, I don't know. That's the thing there. It, it's just I, I can prove very simply that you do need to do something to take this into account, but I can't explain it well enough, and that bugs me. Not being able to explain things sucks. And there's a lot of that on this stream because most of the time I'm either in the, well, I'm normally in the middle of learning something or trying something out for the first or second time. So that is that. But let's have a quick look at the chat. Um, traits and GLSL would be interesting, yes. Can you have or pass around an arity overloaded lambda? I guess not. An arity overloaded lambda. What do you mean by that? What would be an example of that, Jace? Um, because I can, for example, pass... Um, like, if I, if I want to... So it's, Foo is, um, I can't just take clamp, I don't think. Oh, I can. Okay. Oh, yeah, because I'm not using it here at the moment. Um, if I was to call clamp down here, what, what would be ambiguous? Let's just try 
Phone call who won. Does that freak out? No, it knows what to do with that. I guess sign is defined for something simple. Um, clamp. Um, let's have a look. Where is sign again? Oops. Foo. Da da da. Let's do sign. Okay, yeah, there is sign for different overloads. I can say that this is sign for VEC4, for example. Um, that compiles. Then we can do pull G on thing, that stage. It's called some pipeline. Some pipeline. And we should see in here somewhere that foo. It's actually probably been stripped out, hasn't it? Because it wasn't used at all. Um, oh, what can we do with this to just... Let's do something bad. There we go. That'll ruin everything. Um, but at least then it will show up in the code. So, foo... Oh, wait a second. What? That is strange. Oh, I it, it just inlined it. Okay. Um, yes, of course. Yes, because you can't. Of course, there isn't a variable called foo which holds a function because functions aren't first class in GLXL. So it has to resolve that. Again, uh, that's probably one of the areas we use uh, the value tracking stuff. It needs to know what this function is. So it has to propagate that function around. Um, but yes, you can see here that VEC4 float results in a VEC4. That's fine. Um, let's undo that breakage and remove foo and compile this and we're all fine. So, <sighs> what to do, what to do. I think for now, I'm going to go with this version purely because that actually matches something that was written by someone who knows what they're doing. Um... Oh, uh, Jason is saying a lambda that does different things depending on the number of args you pass in redu uh, reducing CL. Yeah, uh, we can't do that in GLSL itself. So you're going to have to resolve everything at compile time. If you're going to have arity overloaded stuff. Um, oh, yeah, of course. N now I see what you're saying. Arity overloaded lambda. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically, if you want to support REST, you're going to have to. I suppose it isn't just supporting REST, is it? It's having different numbers of arguments. So you can have, what do we support that? I think we do support that. Yes, yes, I think we do. So I think you can have, let's have a look actually. Let's see if this is roughly what you're saying about. If we have a function called blah, um, and it takes a float and multiplies the float. And then we have another uh, version of blah, which takes a y, which is a vec4, and um, adds it to itself. That compiles. Um, then I can take, I can say foo um, is blah. And then I can song call um, foo passing in um, one. And that will compile. Uh, let's see if that ended up in the Yeah, there we go. There's there's blah taking float, and um, here's vec four one. Here's blah zero. So if we go up and look for blahs, do we get both versions of blah in there? No. Okay, well, let's do both of them. Do do do. So now we can see we have blah zero and blah being called. And if we go up, we can see blah and blah zero are both in the code here. Um, so does that roughly cover what you're saying? Um, yeah. Okay. So that is where my thoughts are on this right now. I'm inclined to um, push this version. Uh, because I think this this is useful, 
right? This is definitely useful, especially if your height map is a texture, it's already simple. Um, Yes, Jace is saying, okay, that's not quite enough though, given that reduce work that works exactly like in CLs would need to be able to take both overloads at once. Yes, so that's the problem, isn't it? So you, you mean you have to um you have to you say skipping. I think it's just skipping for you though, Jace. Everything is looking pretty solid on my end. Um Yes, you, you have to be able to resolve all this stuff statically. And that's one of those areas where traits just feel really good. They're easy to statically resolve and everything monomorphizes out nicely. And I just I just like I like what I've experienced with it so far making the other type system. Um so yeah. Alright, so I'm thinking I'm gonna push this. Um and and this code as it is now. Um I'm not super happy with it. I would like to revisit it. And I am open to any suggestions and things like this. It's one of those areas where I know... I've got very used to doing these streams, getting a feel for what I'm very bad at doing on camera. Um, and as soon as there's really actually heavy concentration required, um, any kind of any kind of getting into the headspace where, where I normally exist when I'm coding, I'm actually really bad at doing that on stream. Um, so I tend to dodge a lot of problems or just fix them off stream. And so that I just need to really go and do some research and that will be fine. Um, so let's do this. Let's do... Um, add new normal gen function. Um, uses... Let's actually um, use approach shown in fat um, for um, that'll do. Cool. So let's push that up. Um, and let's push this. So, hack. Um, oh no, actually, before we do this, let's get it back into a nicer state. Um, let's disable the normal visualization. Let's pull back a bit. Let's go to render and swap out. Oh, let's get rid of this blah stuff. And let's. Um, Comment out the sign stuff. Bring these clamp arguments down. And it's freaking out. Oh yeah, because we actually still call blah down here. Do, do, do. And then at least we're back to a terrain that actually shows the parallax mapping kind of working. And we can see the issues that you get on boundaries. We can see the issues you get at 45 degrees uh, when things aren't set up to, to tile well. Um, yeah, we have something there. I think that's enough. So, parallax, uh, not parallax, what am I talking about? Have I been saying parallax? I feel like I have. Um, sorry, planar mapping. Kind of working. Um, not satisfied with normal gen. Um, I need to do some research to really, uh, really feel, really feel comfortable with that. I will push that up. That is done. And then I wanted to talk to you about our Lord and Savior GPU based um, occlusion mapping. So, I'm working on this game right now, and it's called Tailspire. And it is interesting in that it is a user content uh, based game. So, people can take tiles and build stuff. What's a good way of showing you some of that? I should just bring up the Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter Tailspire. Um, Let's see if we can get some kind of 
footage and stuff like that. Let's get some good. We got some higher shots. So. That's interesting. I thought that was a GIF. I guess it's because I don't allow things. And allow Kickstarter. And there's probably a whole bunch of other stuff I should allow as well. Just want to get it that we're actually getting the real content. Dun, 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 chug, 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 chug. Right. View image. Okay, so people are able to build stuff. And they build really big things. Um, actually, I do think that we have a very quick clip of... Um, I'm going to have to see me again. Um, yes. Oh, wow, that fucking was right on it. People who have built really fucking big stuff. So yes, people are able to make... Like, this is a, will be a kind of medium-sized town... Um, people are going to be able to build really fucking big worlds. We're talking like 30 by 30 by 10 kilometer maps. Um, so being able to avoid doing work is very important. And obviously on the rendering side, um, not drawing things we don't need to is really, really useful. Now, when you use um, Unity, one of the things you can do is have it pre-calculate lots of occlusion information and bake that information out that is then used dynamically when your camera is moving around the world um, to occlude things. And so the idea is if something is in front of something else, then don't draw the thing that's behind. Um, but we can't bake anything offline because our users are making stuff on the fly. So what we really need is um, a way of doing that in real time. Um, and it feels like one of those things. It's kind of like, hey, the GPU should be pretty good at this. Like, we're doing a lot of similar work a lot of times. Because um, one of the ways we could do it, for example, is to basically render the scene, right? If you, if you draw the scene once, then you can easily tell from the depth, uh, the depth buffer what stuff is going to be visible. You can, uh, like, run a job for each object and, say, and look at the depth buffer and go, oh, I'm actually behind... All of, my, all of my stuff is behind something else so I can be discarded. But of course, then we're just saying we'll render the scene once and then we'll render it again in an effort to make rendering it once faster, which is obviously bullshit. But it's an idea. If you're able to render out a lower uh, resolution version, you can do a conservative approach of that. So say if it was, a, say it was like 100 by 100 pixels and we just have the depth information. Now, um, we're going to have to pick... But, so we can we could probably render it a bigger size and then sh um, shrink it down and then we can pick the furthest uh, um, distance in each of the pixels that was collapsed into one pixel um, and yeah then we can use that as a very conservative estimate of when checking to see if something should be drawn um, there are um, approaches for occlusion mapping that do this on the um, that do this on the CPU uh, but there are also approaches that are doing it on the GPU, and that's kind of interesting to me. So that's GPU occlusion. Um, what am I saying? Not occlusion mapping. Um, guys, what is going on today? Just more tired Wednesdayness. Um, occlusion culling. Thank you. There we go. So GPU occlusion culling. Um, and so let's go and have a look at this article. This is what I think we are going to spend a couple, well, probably about three weeks um, trying to implement a simple version of. So the idea is, um, let's have a look in here because, okay. Yeah, let's just read the start of this and then we'll get into some details. So occlusion culling is a rendering optimization technique that refers to not drawing triangles uh, or measures in general that would not be visible on screen due to being occluded, i.e. they're behind something. Performing render, um, redundant shading um, to triangles that are going to be obscured is like obviously costs us a lot, has a negative impact on performance. Um, so we don't want to do that whenever we can. There are ways to avoid this work um, for occluded triangles in general. A front-to-back um, sorted draw call list for solid meshes 
um, or a Z pre-pass um, will practically eliminate overhead of shading um, to the occluded pixels. A G buffer pass or a visibility buffer pass can help reduce the cost as well, reducing the overhead of vertex shading or at higher levels submitting work to the GPU for occluded props is a harder task. Um, so one option to attack or occlusion culling at a higher level is by determining on the CPU which props will be occluded by big occluders like walls using software rasterization. So basically doing the same thing we're just talking about in the GPU, but do it on the CPU side. So actually render the screen in really, really small version, and then you can look up into that, um, that depth buffer you've got on the CPU side to say, hey, should I be submitting this to the GPU at all for being rendering? Um... <laughs> All right, so oh, there's some people pimping the um, the Kickstarter. Thank you, Darius. Um, sure, saying I am pledging to no Dungeons and Dragons devilry. It's all right. You can have any kind of devilry in there if you've got it on a grid. Grid-based devilry is allowed. Um, right, so. Um, So yes, we can use software rasterization um, to to do this thing. We can build up that depth buffer, and then we can not submit things to the GPU um, for drawing um, if they are guaranteed to be behind something else, guaranteed to be occluded. Um, it feels a little bit weird, though, when you're drawing stuff, to be doing that on the CPU, when the GPU is obviously made for doing this. But obviously, we're trying to avoid... Um, giving the GPU more stuff to do anyway. Like we're trying to minimize the amount of work it needs to do. So if we are gonna hand this off to the GPU, we need to be sensible about the way we do it. Um, so yes, um, so the CPUs cannot do rasterization as fast as GPUs. So the success of this technique will depend on such things as the number of occluders that need to be rasterized, their size on screen, the resolution, etc., etc., etc. Nevertheless, this technique is successfully being used in game engines like Frostbite and games like Killzone 3 for low resolution inclusion buffers. Um, ooh, apparently they have an implement Intel have an implementation which is kind of interesting. But I am actually wanting to do it on the GPU because our pushing pixel stuff is um, is uh, like we it's very easy for us to prototype stuff on the GPU and we haven't done much stuff with compute on the stream yet so i'd like to do that um so i thought this might be a fun task and it would help me at work which is really nice so i'm looking into whether i do this for tailspire um because we can't pre-bake stuff there's we can't take these maps and process them um, in unity offline um it would be really cool if we can do something significant uh, because one of the things that users are very uh, much allowed to do is just stack up hundreds of thousands of tiles. There's nothing wrong with that, except for me. Like, it's a nightmare for me, because now we're rendering shit tons of things that we will never see. And that work really does add up. And, like, in the current alpha, you can feel the pain of this at certain levels, even with all the instancing. Um, just the amount of things that need to be processed, you know? So, blah, 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 blah. I'm just trying to see if there's any other scenes that would be um, of interest for this. Probably not. For showing scale. But no, I don't think so. Um, I was just pasting things in from Discord. Okay, so. If we were going to do this on the CPU side, we'd want to make it really fast because that's the whole point. And we don't actually have a nice setup for working with SIMD yet. So we're going to ignore that. We're going to do things on the GPU because that's quite easy for us. And we'll see. So, okay. So the GPU, on the other hand, is a very efficient rasterizer, which can determine occlusion very quickly. And indeed, GPUs have supported occlusion queries in hardware for some time now. Occlusion queries. They're really cool. They can tell you how many pixels of a given thing being drawn actually were drawn and what was discarded. Uh, the problem when you combine them with instancing is it's going to tell you that for the entire set of instances. So if you say there's a, like look at the Tailspire case, there's a lot of grass tiles here. Um, so if I'm, I'm using, we're using instancing already to draw these uh, grass tiles faster. 
So if we did occlusion queries, what it's going to tell us is how many pixels of all these grass tiles made it through. That's not going to give us enough information to be able to say, oh, this specific grass tile isn't visible, so we can um, not render that. So that's not going to work for us. In fact, I think that probably says up here, um, although they provide an exact occlusion results down to the number of pixels that are visible, they have two main disadvantages. First, their granularity is at draw call level, uh, meaning um, that we must fence each draw call with a pair of queries. If you have a thousand draw calls in your main pass, you'll need twice as many queries. Um, that's a thing. I think don't think we've done um, GPU queries on the stream. Um, but they're quite easy to do from Kappa. Um, if you use instancing, the result of the query will refer to all of the instances of a prop. This is exactly what I was just talking about. Um, attempts have been made to improve this using a hierarchy. The second disadvantage is you also need to read the results back to the CPU in order to decide whether a prop is visible. Now, if you remember, or if you were around, um, We've done some work before with um, submitting draw calls, um, which were described on the GPU side. So we have this thing called, oh no, it's not MapG. Where, where was it? Did we have, um, I can't actually remember how we did this now, but we have support for um, indirect pretty sure we have support for indirect i remember us adding it maybe i haven't pushed it into um into the public build yet let's just have a look um da -da -da -da, multi draw is interesting let's have a look what is this the documentation for make gpu buffer indirect command arguments this is interesting <laughs> i'm gonna need to go back and find out how this worked um when do we use indirect? If index type equals zero, um, index type is coming from upper stream index type. So, okay, it's defined in the stream itself. All right, we'll have to look into that. But basically, we have a way of describing a draw call as data, storing that in a GPU buffer, and then saying from the uh, CPU side, hey, submit draw call using the information that's in this GPU buffer. And what that allows us to do is um, is what we can avoid the round trip. So we can have a compute shader make the buffer of instructions of things to draw. And then from the CPU side, we just say, hey, go and draw everything that that buffer says to draw. And so we have one draw call that goes over and then a ton of work that's done. And we don't have this round trip stuff, which can be quite costly it would be really cool to be able to do this. And that's what I'm interested in in this technique. Um, blah, 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 blah. So the second disadvantage is you need to result, read the results back to the CPU. So let's imagine we do this really cool thing on the GPU, which works out what objects are included. It's like we give in 100,000 things that we want to draw, and it tells us that only 2,000 things are actually visible. Everything else is hidden by some wall and stuff like this. Great. Now it's got to pass those 2,000 things back to the CPU so we can make a draw call saying, hey, go draw these 2,000 things. Feels a bit wasteful. If we already have the information on the GPU, let's shove it in a buffer somewhere and then say, hey, just, just use that. Use that thing we've already set up. Um, and that's only possible with more recent versions of GL and direct text. So we're going to be using um, GL 4.1 and up. Um, it's like it's saying this, this additional work is highly undesirable. So typically rendering engines do not want to wait for the current frames occlusion results, um, but use ones from the previous um, or the previous frame or the one before that. 
and that might introduce some popping. It's that's very much a kind of trade-off. Like, oh, getting this information back is going to take a while. So let's just use the the occlusion information we have from last time, and then we'll use this one next time. You know. So you're always using slightly out of date data. You could. What you could do is you can look at how your camera is moving. And when you're doing the occlusion stuff, you could move the camera too far or extend the field of view so it includes everything that you, from now and the next frame. But it's still an estimate. You don't know what your user is going to do with your mouse or your gamepad, so you could still get it wrong. Um, an alternative to hardware occlusion culling um, is to produce a low-resolution occlusion buffer on the GPU by rendering the occluder's depths and produce a hierarchical um, high z MIP chain of that buffer. What that means is we're going to render the scene at low resolution and then we are going to um, make mip maps from it. I think that's what that means. If it doesn't, then I'm already in trouble. And then we can determine occlusion of each prop by calculating the screen space size of its aligned axis bounding box and use that to select the mip level um, to basically look up the thing we want. So if it's a really big object, we don't need to check like if all of it, if all of it, its uh, texels are going to be um, t visible, uh, we could use the much lower resolution version of the version of the occlusion map, and which is going to have big fat results. Uh, so we can say, hey, is our big fat thing um, occluded in this big fat version? So yeah, that's that's the general idea, and it means that we only have to render the scene the scene once. We're going to get some details on that very soon. Um, replacing it with a fixed number of texture reads for, in the case of Splinter Cell. The visibility test results are then passed back to the CPU, which uses them to submit unoccluded props for rendering. This is good so far, but again, we've still got that passed back to the CPU thing. Um, yeah, th this is good because it takes care of the instancing problem, is the short version of this. And the real issue is that CPU needs to know which props are occluded or not in order to submit them for rendering. But this isn't true with modern APIs, as there is API functionality to let the GPU determine and set up its own work up to a degree using compute shaders um, or write to buffer in general. Um, da -da -da -da, there's oh, two very useful presentations, which I won't look at now. Um, they describe approaches uh, that go much deeper, including mesh batching into units of fixed number of vertices. That I definitely don't want to do. I am very, like, we don't need to go overkill here. I'm, I'm very much interested in, in um, just, let's, let's get another shot. So this, for example. Um, a lot of these tiles are made up of a few assets. Um, and I'm quite happy just to include or not include an entire asset. Um, that is going to mean that we we um, end up drawing many more things than we need to but it's also going to work out okay for us given that we have a fairly regular um, sizing of tiles and things like this it's not going to be a big deal if we're drawing a bit more than we need to the idea in general is just to cover the cases where someone just makes a huge stack of tiles like this just big fucking mountain of them um and we don't want to be drawing all the insides of the mountain um do, 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 do. yeah so that for example this table um has a few assets in it there's the chairs and the mugs and things like this i believe might be separate assets um and then they're all positioned together Uh, what else is going on? Okay, so, so that's the thing. There's, there's these really cool things. Let's see if I can show you it. I, I've seen the graphic, um, and I saw someone implementing this, which was fucking crazy. Um, yes, look at this. So they break down the mesh into patches of fixed numbers of um, vertices, and then they're able to do occlusion culling on these patches. So you end up only drawing like bits of the object which are which is crazy that's so cool um but is i think massive overkill for what we're doing here um so yes what what i want to do is what this article describes which is basically taking the thing from before which is doing that um render the scene do the mip maps 
uh, depending on the size of the object, look up in the specific mipmap level, um, and you have you get yourself a conservative um, occlusion culling thing. Uh, doing those lookups in a compute pass, and then producing a um, a GPU buffer of draw calls that will then submit with the multi-draw indirect stuff. Um, and that is going to be our plan. Could we have an example of that? Would be really cool if uh, the works so the Keppel examples. What? Oh yeah, Keppel dot examples. Examples uh, indirect draw and a multi. How dare you? There's got to be a branch for that though. Um, branch. This is clearly not all the branches. Um, oh wait, it might be in tests. Rather than the examples, let's have a look at Keppel dot tests, tests. Um, I see transform feedback. I don't see indirect, but wrap indirect. Phrase indirect command count. Da, da, da. What is this? No, this is to do with transform feedback stuff, which is never mind. I will make up some examples for another day. I'm pretty sure we had some. I'll jump back into the old video and uh, and find out what we did. Um, but that's the general idea. Okay, so. Let's go on a very a kind of carry on our whistle stop tour of this thing. I want to actually check in chat as well. Um... <laughs> Do you remember saying I may be a heathen, but not that kind? Good on you. Fight the power. Darius is like, easy, just throw an AI at it that works out, figures out what your user does next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got to love that. What throw machine learning at it? I've got to start up now. Um, people in boardroom nodding agreeingly. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, Shimera's way ahead. One million dollars throwing yet another deep neural net startup. Absolutely. Um, bug number 13 saying, has anyone got an experience with the T... Cod library, the common Lisp library. Um, Median says maybe add Cobble Zero JPEG to Media. The reason I didn't do that is because I just pulled it off a of Google search and I don't know what its copyright um, situation was. If um, you'd like to submit um, something, uh, a texture which is uh, valid for us to use, uh, something in the public domain or CC like or in Creative Commons in a way that makes sense, then I'm happy to include it. Um, but I don't want to steal anything. Let's see what this decod thing is. Um, Lisp GitHub, I guess. CLTCOD. Bindings for libtcod, whatever the heck that is. Um, oh, a roguelike library. Okay, no, I haven't tried that, and I am a bad person to give any opinions on that because I know nothing about roguelikes. Okay, so... And yes, our series are spot on. Um, okay, let's have a look. So, render the depth of all main occluders to the occlusion buffer. So the occlusion buffer is just going to be a texture, right? Um, but it's going to be a texture with a depth sense of view. Fine. That's cool. Uh, these terminology is going to be in terms of direct X. So I think this is just a depth sense. A, a, bah. We're rendering to an FBO with a depth stencil um, texture attached to it. Depending on your rendering budget and or the occlusion accuracy requirements, the buffer can be full resolution or it can be lower, half quarter resolution. This would be interesting actually, because there are some really good upscaling algorithms out there and I've never looked at any of them. And I wonder how, I wonder if something cheap enough would actually give you good results. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen certain games use that to great effect. Um, 
Okay, so a low resolution buffer, for example, would be prone to occluding small props more than it should. Um, I'm not as worried about this, again, because there is a certain kind of uh, size range which um, in Tailspire which, of things that's going to make sense. So I'm not overly worried about that. Um, it can be of power of two dimensions to help with the mip map chain production or not. Um, I'm not sure the Froblins demonstrates how the reduction can work with a non-power of two occlusion buffer dimensions. Okay, so we'll have to look into that. We'll just do the power of two. I think we'll start with the power of two. You don't need a pixel shader to write depth to the occlusion buffer. Only a simple vertex shader, something that doubles the rate of writing. So what we're going to do is we're going to be really lazy. We're actually going to make the scene that we're rendering square. We're going to make our camera um, aspect ratio one to one. Um, and then this will map exactly to that. We'll do full resolution pass. And um, then we won't have to worry about any of this stuff. Uh, because the idea is just to get a hang of the technique and then I can dig into it more, porting it to Unity and stuff like that. Um, da, 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 da. You don't need a pixel shader to write depth to the occlusion buffer, only a simple vertex shader. I think that is also true for OpenGL. Um, and we do support uh, pipelines with no fragment shader, so that will work fine. Um, Darius is saying I have to leave early. We'll catch up on YouTube. Wish you a great week. See you next Wednesday. You too, mate. And... Uh, yeah, have a good one. Okay, it may be worth considering a screen uh, resolution or quarter resolution occlusion buffer in cases you would like to reuse the buffer to prime the main rendering Z buffer to reduce further reduce overdraw. That's really cool, right? So if you've got a, a low resolution, slightly conservative, um, as in by conservative I mean it chooses to say that things are slightly further away than they actually are um, rather than nearer. Um, so as not to over occlude um, that's roughly what I mean anyway um, if you've already got that depth buffer then you can when you render the scene you can use that as your starting re uh, depth buffer which means when you render stuff that is further away it's going to get culled automatically because unless you're sorting sorting all your draw calls you're going to render some things that are um, how do I want to put this Okay, so the occlusion is going to cut out a bunch of stuff, but you're still going to be rendering some things that are going to end up being hidden. Um, and starting off with this um, with this lower resolution depth buffer could mean you end up chopping some of that out sooner, which is really cool. Um, anyway, yes. In my simple demo, I rendered rend some large walls using a null pixel shader producing uh, this... 1024 by 1024 Z buffer, which is very cool. So, this is another thing. Um, it sounds expensive at first, like, oh my god, we're going to be rendering this entire scene once to be able to do this stupid thing. No, and um, but there's still a lot of detail here. But what we can do, of course, is we don't have to render um, this actual scene. What we could could do is just render um, the axis aligned bounding boxes. Um, so this table could become this, which this one's tricky because this would, ugh, didn't want that. By doing this, this could over occlude. So you want something as tight as possible. I mean, if you can afford to draw all the actual geometry, that's really good. But for each of these props, we might just be able to do a shrink mapped version Kind of like how, how you do for physics engines. And we can see if that's good enough um, for the occlusion side of things. That's something we'll have to look into. It might be something I try out. Um, but that would mean then... Um, bloody hell. That rather than... Um, something about drawing on top of this GIF is not liking. That is really interesting. Um, yeah. Rather than actually submitting all this geometry to do the culling, we could just um, use instancing again and say, hey, I want you to put all of these bounding boxes in all of these places, all these access line bounding boxes. Uh, this is its position. This is its size. Go do. Um, or here is this low poly version of this object. Go render that instead. Um, yeah, Shimera saying probably have to going to lot it. Yeah, exactly. So we'll, we'll do a lower resolution version of all these things. Um, for the first pass. Now, the first pass is where you want to be as accurate as possible. Um, 
because any place that you say you're occluded, like any place that we so if we made this table bigger, it would start hiding things that technically should be visible. So that wouldn't be great. Um, but yes, let's go with that. So that, that's the rough idea. We're going to do something like this. So what we'll do in our test, what I would like to do is just have a load of spheres. We're going to make a shit ton of spheres of different sizes and different colors. And we are going to... The color information is going to be in... Um, uh, the per instance information and so yeah the position and colors are all going to be per instance data and then we are going to have this thing go through render them all out into the depth buffer and then we're going to um, do occlusion culling on them and so what we're going to have the do we're going to have is the compute shader is going to produce the um, the per instance data that's uh, trimmed down and the um, that's going to be interesting, actually. Do you trim down the per instance data, or do you just create indexes into it? Not sure. Yeah, we'll have to see. Um, okay. Hierarchical Z MIP chain. So create a hierarchical Z MIP chain. Let's just Google that, make sure. Hey, another article. This term does seem to be used a lot <laughs> um, in this. <laughs> the hierarchical Z buffer algorithm uses two data structures. Da, 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 da. This is interesting. The depth buffer, depth buffer should be a MIP zero in a full MIP chain of render targets. Now downsample the render target containing depth information, filling out the entire MIP chain. We do this by rendering a full screen effect with a pixel shader, taking the last level of the MIP chain and downsampling into the next, preserving the depth highest depth value in the sample. Okay, so this just sounds like we're going to be populating all the MIP levels um, with our own with our own shader. And that's what we've got here. This is downscale. So in your downsampling shader, you can either, um, in each step, you can either use the full uh, texture reads to read the depths to calculate a maximum or gather operation that will return all four depths with one read. So we'll, we'll be doing something. The important thing here is it's using max to um, compare. So you always want the, I guess the greatest distance. Yes. Because what we're doing is we're taking um, some detailed information and we're shrinking it down. So we're going to have to take the most conservative uh, value, which is going to be the one that's furthest away. So we're not over occluding. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's create a hierarchical Z MIP chain of the occlusion buffer using the max operator to produce the next MIP level. Max operator. To produce each MIP level. So we're going one by one, producing all the ones. Um, so we're downsampling, then downsampling, then downsampling using this function, as far as I can tell. Um, this notation in DirectX is called something. I can't remember what this is for. Basically, it's telling the shader compiler the intent of what this value is used for. Um, so I'm going to need to look into this. Ah, okay, so this is in a compute shader? Interesting. Oh yeah, it actually mentions it here. I'm using a compute shader to do the downsampling, although I don't expect a particular advantage in doing so, especially as I don't have access to ASIC compute to overlap tasks. I think I would do that with a fragment shader. This this to me is like a full screen, full screen quad, and um, yeah, do the downsampling there. Okay, yeah, we go. In your downsampling shader, in each step, you can either use four texture reads. Oh, yeah, we just read that already. I'm also interested in this uh, async compute thing to overlap tasks. I'm assuming that means that each compute job, even though it's running the task, the, the job in parallel across the GPU, 
it still has to do one compute job and then the next compute job and the next compute job rather than doing multiple compute jobs at the same time. Um, that is interesting. So we should look into this at some point and see what is the analogous thing in um, OpenGL. Um, demystifying async uh, OpenGL. Do they have something similar? It's not jumping out. It just seems to be a DirectX thing at the moment. This might be an extension for that. Right, we will not worry about that right now. Um, let's go back to here. So, render everything, down sample. So we end up with this kind of thing. Running the compute shader as many times as you like to produce the number uh, required number of MIPS, you'll get something similar to this uh, buffer here, showing just a few levels. So it's probably not showing up very well on the stream, but you start to see the lower and lower resolution. This one's, comparing these two is very clear. Compo Preparing the rest is a little tricky on the stream. Um, prop visibility calculation. Okay, so now we've got this information. Next, I have packed data for instances of props in a structured buffer. Structured buffer in um, in OpenGL parlance is, I think it's an SSBO. Um, there we go. Someone had a translation thing. Um, direct X, um, OpenGL translation uh, terminology. Terminology, I can't type. I think this was it. Yes, here we go. Structured buffer. Whoop. Let's paste this down here. Shimera is saying, hmm, if you render to a color buffer, can you designate which MIP level to render to? Um, well, the MIPs are separate images, so I would bind those to an FBO and just render into them. Would be my thought. Um, okay, so a structure buffer is no specific name. It's a subset of SB SSBO features. Um, so that is fine. So if we use an SSBO, we're going to be okay. Um, cool. Right, where do we get to? He's using an SSBO. The world transform as well as the access align bounding box should be enough. Um, at this point, you can decide whether to let the GPU perform uh, Frustum culling along with occlusion culling. Then you'll have to um, pass data for all instances in your world or do the Frustum culling on the CPU and pass that. I'm not going to worry about that for our example. I'm just going to submit everything. Um, I haven't decided exactly how I want to do that yet. I mean, it, uh, using Unity these days, it's very easy to make nice parallel jobs, which would do that really fast. Um, we have the bounding boxes for these things, so it should be fine. I, I, I don't see this being a particularly interesting problem, um, so I'm not going to worry about it yet. Since occlusion will take space take place on the GPU and the res results consumed by the GPU as well, uh, without CPU intervention, we will need to use. Ta -da! Okay, so this is the function draw indexed instance indirect. Um, it's called multi draw indirect um, in OpenGL. Um, and we've already got that supported in Keppel, or we did have it, it might still be in a branch, we can look at that, not a problem. Um, and basically you give it a buffer where the information about the draw calls are and a number of bytes to look into, like the offset into that buffer of where you expect things to be. So for us in Keppel, there's gonna be a GPU array um, that's gonna hold the information and that is fine. Um, 
the chase saying last I looked you have to specify the mipmap level in order to come up with a particular image to attach um, so let's have a quick look time is it 2235 nice so let's make ourselves a texture. Its initial contents are going to be nil, and its dimensions are going to be 512 by 512. And it is going to have um, mitmaps. Um, let's just say true. I think it will generate the max number then. Uh, that makes sense. And generate mitmaps is set to true. So that's fine. Uh, let's just do that. Okay. Have no element type or initial contents to infer the element type from. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's do that again. Um, so we have to go. Element type is going to be let's just say float. Right. So now we've got our texture. So def uh, uh, temp zero is that. We have ten mipmap levels. So then if we do text ref on temp zero and specify mipmap level. Three, we can get that, which is a GPU array, which is backed by texture, which should mean we'd be able to make an FBO, um, which uses that. Didn't like that, did it? Um, I meant to give it a pattern, yes. Um, FBO, I think you do zero like this, okay. Oh, that's a horrible error. Boo! These are bad errors. We're going to have to go and fix these. Um, what is the bloody pattern? I should just read the documentation. Oh, come on now. Don't be silly. Okay. I'm just going to get this rendering again. What the fuck? That's really weird. <laughs> okay, so anyway. So yeah, we can take individual images from mipmap levels of another texture and bind those to an FBO. That's fine, which means then we can render into them. Um, so we would read from one right into another, but that might not be what Shin is saying because he tends to know a lot of this stuff already, actually. Um, Shimera says, depending on how resampling works when the viewport doesn't match the target image, you could potentially attach multiple maps to the same FBO and render in one go, getting the downsampling for free. The, the reason I can't, the reason I'm not sure about that is because the way they specify this is that we're specifically trying to, like, we're going to, we're going to render, we're going to, ah, come on, words. We're going to sample for texels, and we're going to use max to pick that. And that produces the next MIP layer. And then we take that one and we downsample that one. If we wanted to do all the MIP levels at the same time, we would have to do that many more MIPs, that many more texture samples um, to do it in one pass, I think. So I don't think that's the way to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think we need to do these in order. Um, so yes, th th they're saying here that this command is the same as just doing an instance draw from DirectX, but the arguments that you would normally pass in here, um, you're going to get from a buffer. So let's just look at this. Multi, multi, draw, indirect, blah, 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 blah. Um, Okay. So you're going to say, "Hey, I want to do a draw. Um, I want my, I want to be dra drawing triangles, for example, is what we're going to be drawing. So triangles, fucking wherever you are. How dare you? Geol triangles. There we go. Um, we're going to be specifying. Um, so what does indirect take in this case? are stored in an array in memory at the address given by indirect. 
That is true unless you bind a buffer to the draw indirect buffer binding. And then indirect is interpreted as an offset in basic machine units, bice in our case, into that buffer. Um, so yes, this is going to be the offset into our GPU array at which you will find the, um, uh, yeah, where, which, where you will find the instructions of how, what to draw. Um, then we're specifying the number of elements in the array of draw parameter structures. Wait a second. This is what I want. No, hold on. Oh no, it's fine. Okay, never mind. Um, yeah, this will specify the number of things in that array of stuff to draw. Um, it's basically the number of these. Um, and then the stride is the distance between each one of these. We're not going to worry about that. But the important bit is we're going to have an array, a GPU array of this stuff. And each one is another draw call. And we get to specify the number of instances. So we're going to have the compute shader work everything out and then produce this, which is going to say, hey, draw these things. Um, so we're going to want it to produce. And that's really the question is, are we going to have it... Um, produce this and create a packed buffer of um, I mean it's going to have to produce some per uh, instance information yeah we'll see um, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work yet but it'll be fine it, it's not a biggie we're writing into an SSBO and then we're going to say hey use this as your uh, per instance information I think that's feasible. Right, okay, so occlusion culling is implemented with a compute shader based on the code from Stephen Hill's blog post, which we should read. Um, and the general idea is we are going to, um, for each thing, uh, we're going to create a bounding box that encompasses that thing. Um, we are going to work out its corners. Um, we are going to put everything in normalized device coordinate space or NDC space. Um, we are going to do the W divide. So we're doing the whole projection stuff by the look of it. Yeah, so we got the view projection thing here. We're doing the W divide, which is normally handled by a fixed function step if you're using the normal rendering pipeline. Um, we're clamping some things. We are then doing what? So we're doing this for each of the points and we're basically working out some minimum Z position. And this is then going to let us, this value, I think, oh no, these value, okay, so yes, we're, we're, make, we're creating the biggest bound, 2D bounding box around this object that makes sense um, with the nearest distance um, in the depth buffer. And then we're going to use that size to calculate which NIP level we're going to read into. And then we're going to... do some clever sampling stuff that was worked out by smart people. And da, 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 da. eventually we end up comparing this min Z down here with max depth and uh, making sure that we should be culling. And we go, oh, look, isn't that great? And we'll append this onto instance data out. Now this is a little bit different from what we're used to in OpenGL, but it's actually very easy to make. If we look at instant data out, it's an append structured buffer, which is, oh, let's look append buffer anyway. Append consume buffer is basically an SSBO with an atomic counter. So the idea is you can just keep appending on the end. It's gonna have a fixed size, but you can keep appending to it. Um, so what we would do is we would make an SSBO uh, with the worst case, which would be everything is visible. So if we are submitting 10,000 things to draw, we'll have a, a, um, a buffer which can hold 10,000 things. And then we're going to keep appending to that information. So we get this nice, tightly packed 
uh, buffer of information. So for us, that'll involve an SSBO and an atomic counter for the index so we can increment that atomically. And that means all of the um, threads, all the, the, the whole, like, yeah, all of the threads of the um, compute shader are gonna be able to append to this buffer asynchronously. That should be okay. Um, I'm not sure if there's some optimizations we can do there with how, like we're doing things, we're, we're creating a short buffer within the warp and then um, using the atomic add to actually take that, um, yeah, that warp local buffer and adding that, appending that onto the end of the SSBO. I'm not really sure. Um, Shimera is saying, still wondering if I can do it in one go. Um, yeah, if you can work out a way, I'd be very interested. But I can't think of a way to do it which doesn't involve a lot more samples in total. Um, but yeah. Yes, because you don't have access to what is going to be the neighboring texel. Um, to you. Cool. Right, so now we've done that. Blah, 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 blah. A compute shader receives the input instance data, all these bounding boxes, and writes out the visible instance prop data, world space transform, in the append buffer. Um, it has to write the data to the argument buffer that will be used by draw. Um, has, it also has to write the data. To, okay, so this is doing exactly what I was saying. We are going to write out the thing to draw, but we're also packing together um, the per instance data um, into a separate buffer. That's cool. Looking at the data draw indexed instances receives, this is their version. I mean, you can see this is very similar to the um, GL one. The... Um, the index count per instance. Okay. Um, but yeah, pretty simple, similar to this. Count, instance count, first base index. Like, this is very similar. This is slightly nicer because we have to do this through some other GL state, which is annoying, but. Right, okay, at minimum, we need to provide the number of instances of the mesh, index, per, index count per instance, and how many instances of the mesh to render instance count. I used a normal um, UAV of five, of a five unsigned, it's buffered. Okay. Let's see what they mean by UAV. First. UAV buffer is an SSBO. Cool. UAV texture is in, like image load store stuff. That's cool. So yeah, that is all right. So let's see if we can pass that sentence now. I used a normal SSBO of a five unsigned its buffer. This must be a typo. To achieve that, and I cheated a bit setting the number of mesh indices on the CPU when initializing the buffer. Okay, cool, so. Of a five unsigned, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, I'm not sure if that, maybe that's where the five is coming from. So basically when he set up the buffer, he pre-populated the, the instance count part because he already, wait a second. No. The number of mesh indices, yeah, you can push that up ahead of time because you would already know that. So maybe you know that, like, hey, I'm going to be drawing but up to a thousand cubes, a thousand spheres, a thousand cones. Um, and then the occlusion thing is going to drop that number down. But you know how many um, verts are in, or how many indices, if you're using index rendering, are in the sphere, the cone, and the, and the cube already. So you can pre-set this up, so then all you're doing is filling in the, the other information. So even if this ends up being, like instance count ends up being zero, we're drawing no cones. It's not a big deal. You waste one draw call, but you're saving tens of thousands, so it's really not a big, uh, not a big deal. 
Um, Shimera's musing on the texture stuff. So um, I suppose you could pack the MIPS yourself into a MIPless texture and then use copy text to transfer the MIP regions and actually MIP texture. Um, but then you'd have to divide up the target region, which might cost you. Yeah, not sure. That's cool though. Um, that is neat. Finally, in the vertex shader that renders the instances of each prop, all I have to do is use um, instance ID to access the data, the world matrix of the current instance. So this thing um, wrote um, like use the append buffer and pushed in the world matrix. So it's like, okay, there's going to be a hundred things and here are, is the buffer of a hundred world matrices all nicely packed together. Um, and then when we submit this draw, all we have to do is take the instance ID and just pull out um, our own data. So in Tailspire, we're going to end up packing more data obviously than just the world transform matrix, but it's pretty cool. Um, and that seems to be the general idea. This is the output of the demo. In it, I have rendered the occluders with stippled alpha to show they actually occlude. Let's have a look at this. Okay. So you see some flickering. So there's definitely um, times where things are being drawn that shouldn't be drawn, but that doesn't matter. Um, we don't care if we do a little bit more work. What we're trying to do is reduce the majority of the work, and this is achieving that very well. Um, it's interesting. It's one of these places where Tailspire, to begin with, or in, at least in its current state, benefits from the fact um, that... Where are you, Tailspire? We have this fixed looking down. I get a lot of complaints of, why are we always looking down? Why can't I place the camera everywhere? Because it's like, you make a map that's 10 miles across, and then you look east, and I have to show you like a decent amount of that. And it's not like I can... Like, take my like, like the uh, sh the stuff that Shimera was talking about, um, and and implemented in the streams of the geometry clip maps. We can't take the um, height maps of the entire world and bring those down, pre-compute them, and pre-process them, and bake them and shit like this, um, so we can read them asynchronously. Like our whole world is being fucked with potentially at any point um, by our users. I mean, technically, there's only 16 people, so there's only a maximum of 16 different zones in the world that they could be screwing with at any one time. Um, but it's still enough, right? It, it's enough that we can't pre-bake this information. It's, it's enough to cause us problems. And we do want to have a cinematic camera. We do want to be able to get lower down into this stuff. We allow you to zoom in, but we keep it fairly restricted, which means at the moment, Frustum Culling alone um, gets us a reasonable performance it does not help with the building big mountains of tiles thing though i mean it's not normally necessary or at least it's kind of necessary in the current version because it's the alpha and there's loads of stuff that's not implemented yet but the idea is it's not it shouldn't be necessary to do that but yeah okay so um da -da -da -da. you can also see that this occlusion culling is conservative in that it will never occlude something that is visible, but it's quite happy to not occlude something that isn't visible. Um, but yeah. This naive first attempt, what we're going to do, will work and will perform the culling on the GPU, but it has at least two disadvantages. First, is it uses an append buffer to output the instance data, which, although it handles synchronization for us, it also offers no guarantee about the order the instances will be written to the buffer. Now, I'm actually fine with this. Um... We don't have a requirement to do front to back. Um, it might help, but it's also not a massive deal to us right now. It's not considered a deal breaker. Like I don't have a reason to be sorting things right now. So I'm not too worried about this caveat. Second, this might be important. Maybe more, more importantly, damn it. Ideally, we'd like to perform occlusion for all instances of all props with one pass in order to reduce the number of draw calls and utilize the compute units better, as opposed to dispatching with a small number of threads groups. We could additionally write argument data for all meshes in one buffer, and since draw indexed instance in blah, 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 uh, receives an offset into the buffer, it sounds plausible to draw all visible instances of prop in one go. Yes. 
Um, yeah, that is true. That is true. Uh, because at the moment we would... We would need... It's going to be very easy in our... This is actually something I wanted to play with once we have our version running. Say we're doing spheres and cubes and cones. Um... We want to submit then three indirect instance draw calls. Here, draw all the visible cubes, draw all the visible cones, draw all the visible spheres. Um, which means that data, that uh, the, the uh, per instance data is going to have to be packed together like that. Um, doing it the way we're doing it means that we would end up with the data for cubes and spheres and things interleaved unless we have separate buffers um, set up to append to, which probably would be fine for um, three things, spheres, cubes, blah, 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 blah. But again, our users can use any props from any pack. So they might have tens of thousands of different, uh, not tens of thousands, let's be realistic. They could easily have hundreds of different kinds of tiles in a single scene. Um, more than we would um, more there would be a, a higher number of different tiles than SSBO binding slots we can guarantee for a broad um, broad enough range of of, uh, of users of GPUs so we need to do something different now, if we're writing into just one one buffer, what we could do is we could allocate it for the worst case. Um, okay, so there might like we have potentially ten thousand things being drawn, and then we're going to start. We would we want to pack all the cube information together here, but then we want to pack all the sphere information there, maybe. We wouldn't actually care if the sphere information was over here. Um, so that's the thing. Like, if there, if there was, a, um, if this was ten thousand, and there were, let's say, um, six thousand cubes, and up to, um, let's do this. Yeah, up to, oops. Three and a half thousand, yeah, let's just do colors for now. Six thousand yellow things, three and a half thousand green things, and um, 500 blue things. All the 500 blue things are being drawn. Like, if this is sized for the worst case, then we can start appending in regions inside this. Would that work? Would that be okay? Um, can we afford that? Like... If we're saying um, that there could be 10,000 things being drawn, that means we need to have a buffer that can store 10,000 um, elements of the per instance data. How big is that data? How much do we need to shove in there? Can we afford this stuff? Um, because then all we need is like one buffer and then one atomic um, int per... Um, tile type or per color in this case and that should work right because that see it's a little different in um in direct x it seems because if um the only way you're allowed I, I this i just totally don't know if this if the only thing you're able to do here is append then they might not allow multiple append points in here but with an ssbo we totally can however um, yeah, wait a second. No, I suppose you could use a UAV buffer plus multiple atomics rather than using an, um, an append buffer, wherever that was. Um, I've lost it. I don't know. Fuck. It should be here, right? There it is. Yeah. So I think we can do the same things on both on DirectX and OpenGL. But again, it's can we afford it? Um, if not, then we're looking at multiple. We're looking at uh, uh, multiple draw calls 
like one draw call for each kind of tile um which isn't I, well it's not the best case anyway let's see what let's see what they talk about what time we got left oh it's 2300 okay we're actually out of time um and i need to get off because my partner needs to make a phone call so no overrunning this time um I'm pretty convinced I want to do this. I hope you would like to join me on this. It feels like a really fun project and it's nice and technical and it gets us to exercise bits of Keppel that we haven't really used on stream yet. Um, so yes, uh, stop by next week. I will take one minute just in case there are any questions coming in. And if not, I'm gonna run away. Um, yeah, thanks for stopping by. This looks like it's gonna be fun. And I'll apply a bit more coffee while I wait those few seconds. Hmm. All right. Glad you enjoyed the stream. Catch you next time.